Hello, everybody. This is Brian Smith with 321 Gang, and you're listening to Change the Conversation. Today, we're pleased to have Kelly Wyrock from Agile Quality Systems with us. Kelly is an expert in the uh, hello Kelly in the medical systems and medical device uh, arena, and we're going to talk a little bit about the five common barriers that medical systems companies have in adopting lean agile practices. Kelly, thanks for joining us. Hi, great to be here. Thanks for organizing, Brian. Yeah, you bet, you bet. So, um, well, let's let's just jump into it, Kelly. What's, uh, t- tell us a little bit about yourself, your history in the medical device area, compliance. I read a little bit on your LinkedIn profile. You've uh, been in this space for quite a long time. Yeah, I've been in the medical device world for over 20 years now. I'm a consultant working for my own company. I do two primary things. I work with companies on their quality management system, getting processes in place for software and systems development that are in alignment with FDA regulations and international regulations, and more importantly, are practical, usable for their organization. Uh, Second thing I do is agile software development training and coaching, and then the blend for me, it's the sweet spot is the combination of both. Medical companies that want to use agile development techniques but need to figure out how to integrate it with their quality management system to satisfy the regulations. Mm. Uh, well, that's uh, some people would say that those things, uh, you know, don't quite fit together. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. So yes, indeed. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. So so let's um, let's start with challenges in medical device um, and medical device development. Can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like uh, th- these days? Yeah, there, there's a, a few key challenges that. I see commonly in medical device organizations, including the one that I that I started Agile with way back in the early 2000s, some barriers that medical device companies face. So the, the, the quick summary of them is that medical companies are, are very often very conservative, especially the well-established companies that have had a quality system for a long time. They're very conservative in their approach to new technologies, new ideas. Uh, a couple mm-hmm. reasons for that. Uh, one is they've got well-established systems that they're comfortable with and so are concerned about the difficulty it's going to take to disrupt that. Uh, but often, more importantly, they're worried about what the regulators are going to think. Uh, medical device companies are very concerned about how regulators view them. So if they're being viewed in a favorable light with the regulators, they don't want to upset that. They don't want to attract attention that they really don't want. Uh, one of the concerns medical companies have is getting regulators asking questions that are that are, are, are difficult for them to answer. And if they've had a good relationship with regulators, they've been working with them well, they've been answering their questions, they don't want to upset that. Right. They get fewer questions. The sort of sounds like me in middle school a little bit, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm over here doing something, but I don't want to attract attention. Everything's going fine. <laughs> yep. Yeah, one of the early concerns we heard in, when, in the days at Medtronic when we were transitioning to Agile was we don't want Agile as a reason to invite more scrutiny by the regulators. We don't want to raise that flag. And we're going to, we're going to talk to later. Uh, no, not, 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 <laughs> no or, and it depends. The answers are often it depends. Uh, right, it right. depends on, on who you're talking to at the FDA. We'll get into this in more detail in a later webinar, but one of the key okay. things that is uh, regulatory submissions people really don't care how you developed your product. They don't care about the process. They care about the end state. They care that you have a good product, that you have good documentation, that you can demonstrate why the product is good, safe, and effective. They don't care as much about how you got there. How you got there. Okay. The compliance yeah, well, people do, do care. The compliance people who are looking at your process that are investigating and doing inspections, they do care. And so that will become visible to the compliance side, but probably not to the submission side. Okay. All right. Yeah, we'll definitely get into that uh, maybe in a later podcast. I think we're thinking, talking about doing, diving deeper into to those things. So, yeah. so, um, so I was doing a little reading and some of the challenges I've read about in medical device arena are devices are more connected. They're, people are expecting devices to, to take home devices and use them like I'm using this webcam right now, right? And so that the doctors or the nurses, whatever, can look at me. I can, you know, they can take my temperature or, you know, all sorts of things, blood tests. Um, the people want to update them remotely. And these are maybe the, you know, the ones that, that have software and some sort of piece of hardware and then connectivity through the internet. Internet of things is probably part of this. 
uh, all the way up to your MRI machines and, and other such uh, large systems. Um, what, what, what else would you add into there for challenges or you know, things well, that, that medical device companies are trying to, to accomplish? So what, what you just highlighted is the medical device companies are often going through changes in their products now, and, and that's difficult. Change is hard. And yep. so changing products, changing systems, changing customer bases, uh, perhaps even changing regulatory environments as organizations grow and in, in, in expand into different markets, all of that is hard, and, and change is hard. And so for a large, well-established medical device company, one of the things that they like to have comfort in is their quality system is, is very mature and well-established in many cases. And so changing that can be hard. And Agile can be disruptive to that quality system, the process, the way they do things. So sometimes organizations are reluctant to take on the additional change of changing the way they do work when they're already dealing with lots of change in their organization, such as their, their products and their markets. Right, right. I use the analogy sometimes. Have you ever been asked to change what email program you use? Yeah, yeah. You no? get, you, you just get so used to it. You just the the thought of changing is just too hard. <laughs> it's so too hard, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's it's amazing to me. I mean, I've changed mine a handful of times, and yeah, there's a little bit of a curve. But but uh, most people I know, especially folks, you know, our age, you know, been been using email for thirty years or something like that. Uh, well, not quite thirty, but anyway. Uh, it's it, the, the thought of changing is too painful. So think about taking that one person analogy to a team of 50 or, or 100 in, when they've had an established process for, for a decade or more. I mean, that's change. Change is hard. That's come up a few times, and I think we'll revisit that uh, when we're looking at yeah. solutions as well. When so, you think okay. about the quality systems are, are, are very complex. There's lots of pieces to it. Um, so, um, agile development affects design controls, but there's more to the quality system than just design controls. There's lots of interconnected pieces, design controls, document controls, change management systems. All of that's a complex system. And for a, 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 a company that's been around for a while, that system has been well established. People know how to use it. They've built their infrastructure around it. So the idea of changing that is daunting because of how much right. would ha might have to change. There better be a lot of benefits to changing or else yes. why bother, right? Exactly. And, and we'll, I think we'll get into that in our, uh, in our next podcast as well. So, yeah. um, so we've got, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, st uh, steal a peek at my notes here. So, you know, so don't break it if it's not broken. I think you, you covered that one. Um, risk can attract attention. What about the, the the agile manifesto? I think I think you, when we were talking about this earlier, you you mentioned that people have some concern with the manifesto itself. Yeah. So the, the agile manifesto, especially the first page, the value statements, was deliberately provocative. Those, those statements of individuals and interactions over process and tools. When you say that, just that phrase to an organization that has significant processes, processes and tools, going, <laughs> yeah. what do you mean I don't need that? I, I right. gotta have that. Um, working software over comprehensive documentation, I have to have documentation. So there were some bad reactions to the Agile Manifesto early on. And part of that is because people didn't always read the last sentence of that page of acknowledging that we value those things on the right, the things on the left matter more. Right. But what many medical companies heard early on was, I need to get rid of my documentation, I don't need processes and tools so much, I don't need a plan so much. All these bad interpretations of the manifesto left the medical device industry thinking, this just doesn't make sense. In fact, my story, I first heard about Agile in the late 90s when Medtronic was inviting speakers that were leading the Agile movement even before the Agile Manifesto was created. And the first few times I heard it, I, my reaction was, you've got to be kidding me. This just does not make sense to a big system product development environment, let alone safety critical and regulated. Well, it's because I had the same misunderstandings that many people had when first hearing about Agile. Right. So, the, the, again, we've got to remember that the, the manifesto was deliberately provocative to get people to change their mindset. And so some people have a bad reaction to that and think, oh, that doesn't apply to me. Well, but really when hard. we get, get back to change, change is hard, is hard right? I, I need to understand what you mean here. And, and when, but when we get further into, re, into the, what the manifesto and the, the, next, the second page, the 12 principles, are trying to uh, describe of why Agile is the way it is, it really does make sense in the medical device industry. There, there's good benefits to achieve 
from using Agile, just like Agile brings benefits to other industries. Those things are good. Those benefits that Agile brings are good for the medical device industry, so we can get over some of those original concerns and bad interpretations. Nice. Okay. Um, looking at my notes again here, so we, we've covered the manifesto. Uh, we've touched upon tools, and and I guess uh, we've touched upon compliance and regulations as well. But is there anything more you'd like to add around that topic as it relates to medical device development? Yes, the, the accepting that in in medical device world you have to satisfy the regulations. You, you have to demonstrate that you've done what the regulators expect. But more importantly, you need to develop a good product. And the way, when I coach organizations in, in quality systems and, and Agile in, in particular, is to emphasize do good work which will satisfy the regulations. So when using the Agile model, it, that has to be done in the context of a solid process. Right. I'm going to talk about a, a guidance document that that, um, that describes how to use Agile in the medical device space. And the first recommendation in that guidance document is to use Agile within the context of a robust quality system. You need to have a solid process to develop good products. I think we, ex we all accept that. And yeah. if you have a solid process, that will satisfy the regulators. So you need sure. to use Agile in that context to ensure that we're set, that we're doing good work when we're demonstrating that we're doing good work. So, um, you know, we're going to assume that people who are watching this podcast know some something about Agile and, and the manifesto and, and the principles. And, and one of the principles is, is the definition of done. So does the definition of done play into the whole documentation and compliance Part of it is that yeah. do you, do you, is that one way to uh, to um, accomplish that? Yes, and and a key element of definition of done is is definition of done means the quality system has been satisfied. So whatever your rules are, that is part of the definition of done. I'm not done until I've satisfied the quality system, that I've produced the records that I need to produce. I've had the reviews I need to have. I have all the pieces connected that I need to have. So the definition of done means whatever our process rules say, we've satisfied them. And we do that in, in, in an incremental model. There's definition of done for a story at a time. When you're completing a small piece, that that small sure. piece needs to satisfy the quality system. Now we know when those all those small pieces come together, there's more to do. So there's another layer of definition of done at increment boundaries or release boundaries, where the whole set of documentation gets assembled to satisfy the quality system. That's also the definition of done. We've produced the documents we need. We've got the reviews we need to have. We have all the evidence we need. All right. So I think uh, that sound that that makes sense to me. So. You know, getting into more of the FDA, then we talked, we touched upon that. I think now you were a co-author of the AAMI. I'm going to cheat here. The Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentations, TIR 45, which is the technical uh, a technical information report. And uh, as part of that, uh, you you covered some topics. Uh, like, do they prohibit or encourage any methodology? Um, so, can you talk a little bit about the, the FDA and and whether they, you know, whether they support or promote or discourage the use of Agile in any way? So, I'll give you a little bit of history to answer that question. That that's exactly what the concern in the industry was in the mid two thousands. In the early two thousands, the, the the leaders of Agile were coming from the world of IT, business applications, web systems. Not so much from product development, and even less from safety critical. So there was kind of a, a trail being blazed in the mid two thousands. So as some medical companies began to use Agile, they became concerned about what the FDA would think about it. That was one of the barriers to entry, and so. The, the industry approached AAMI, the, an industry association, asking to give some guidance. So the software committee of, of AAMI kicked off a subcommittee to create a guidance document that became TIR 45, the guidance on the use of Agile for medical device systems. That committee included industry people and the FDA. So together we wrote this guidance to describe how to use Agile in a way that will satisfy regulatory expectations and produce a safe and effective product. Right. So that, that document gives some key uh, recommendations of how to align Agile. And, and the first one I mentioned earlier is use Agile within the context of a robust quality management system. 
if right. you don't have a good process, if you aren't in already in good shape to satisfy the regulators, Agile is not going to be the answer for you. But mm. if you've got a good quality system or a quality system that needs improvement, Agile can fit well within that. In fact, Agile can help to improve it. So the fir first recommendation, again, is for to use Agile in the context of a robust system that already satisfies the regulators. Okay. There, are, uh, there are other key takeaways. We're going to get into more detail of that document. But the key of that document is it provides a framework to understand how to align the concepts of Agile with the concepts of the regulatory world. And it's, it's all about alignment and meeting expectations. Okay. Uh, you, you asked specifically if what's the FDA's view of Agile. And sure. The, the FDA has been very clear in their design control guidances that they do not demand a certain life cycle model. They do not demand a certain process. Mm -hmm. In fact, the regulation from the FDA called design controls is about the controls that you must have on your process. It doesn't define a process. It defines the controls you need to have. Mm -hmm. They leave it up to the manufacturer to, de to define the process that they'll use and the life cycle model that, they'll, that you'll use. They do not demand a certain process, a certain model. So it's okay to use Agile just as it's okay to use any other development life cycle model as long as you satisfy the design control regulations and you have the proper controls in place. Um, I, I did want to touch on the scaled Agile framework. So we've yeah. been sort of tossing around more lean Agile types of phraseology, and I know that you are a um, safe program consultant. And mm -hmm. and I wanted to ask, you know, where does the scaled Agile framework fit in with medical device companies? So this relates to one of the other barriers that we saw with Agile in the medical device space is as we're talking about Agile, people hear it as that's a software thing, it's not a system thing. And most medical device companies have systems that include software, electrical elements, mechanical elements, they develop systems. Right. And, and the larger medical device companies have big systems, systems with multiple products and the multiple subsystems being built by multiple teams. And that's where the scaling frameworks come in and become helpful. Is, and one of the things that attracted me to the SAFE environment is SAFE speaks the language of systems development. It talks about systems architecture. It talks about the importance of structure in a product, structure in a backlog to produce it, structure in the teams that are going to produce that. And so the scaling frameworks address some of the practical constraints of a big organization trying to manage the development of a big system, whether it has lots of software or hardware as well. Yeah, 3 to one Gang, as you know, was part of the uh, development of that content for the, on the system side of the big picture. So we certainly um, understand a lot of those uh, challenges, uh, and medical device is one of the, one of the places that we, we agree uh, these principles ought to be uh, applied yes. more. So, yes. so um, and then, let's see, uh, tools. Can you very briefly talk about tools and their role within uh, medical device development and, and agile lean practices? So tools and processes are to help teams perform better. And the bigger the team, the more complex the system is, the more complex the team developing is, the more you need tools to help you manage that complexity. So tools are essential in any development organization of any size. Within the Agile model of managing backlogs, managing multiple layers of backlogs, managing multiple teams, managing all the artifacts that come from the de execution on those backlogs with the teams are delivering, you need tools to manage that. The, the, the most important by far is a change management system and the tools to support it. Agile right. is all about being in a constant state of change. Every backlog item is a, represents a change to the existing system. And so change management is key. When you're making changes dozens of times during a sprint, thousands of times during a big project, you need to manage change. And this is where the tools come in. Change management for managing the plan and the, the, the proof that you've completed the plan. Mm -hmm. Management of all the artifacts that go with executing that. Managing the artifacts of requirements, design documents, the code itself, and, um, design artifacts like specifications for hardware, um, part drawings tests that demonstrate the product works and the results of executing that has all of that stuff needs to be managed and this and tools come in to help manage that complex pile of the rapid change model that agile encourages 
You've mentioned a few times that change is hard. Um, very briefly, uh, we're, we're sort of running out of time here, but uh, very briefly, can you touch upon how organizations can implement or begin to implement Lean Agile and or Scaled Agile framework practices successfully within their organizations? Yep. Oh, good. This is a nice lead into the next podcast we're thinking of doing the, it, where first is have a reason to. Have some benefit that you're going after, something that you want to improve in your organization, in your products, in your teams. Have some reason. Hopefully something measurable, right? Hopefully something, yes. a real project with, with real tangible results yeah. with, uh, that's important to your organization, right? Yes. So you have a reason to change. You have some some reason to believe that Agile will help you achieve that benefit and some way to know that you've got there. Some right. indicator, some measure that says, yes, indeed, this is helping us or no, it isn't. And we got to go a different path. Right. So have a reason. Have a reason that that Agile you think will help you have a way to, to assess whether you're there. Sure. Then have a have a team. You mentioned having a real product, have a team working on a real product blaze the trail. Um, we sometimes hear about why we want to try a, a pilot first. We want to experiment, want to try something. And while that's helpful and that, that's kind of a conservative approach, uh, until you do things for real, it's not real. And, not and so, real, right. So doing it on a real product with real problems, wanting to produce real results uh, is an essential thing. Now, in an organization that's worried about the transition, you need to you need to uh, protect that that first attempt at it to ensure that we can allow space for learning. We can allow some for some missteps early on, and adapt as we go. Um, but doing it for real is key. Um, yeah. And then the th third thing I'd recommend is is get help. If if you don't have an organization that already knows how to use Agile, get help from people who've done it before. Um, there's lots of training out there. There's lots of guidance. But until you do it yourself and get used to it, it there, there's lots to learn as you go. So right. you, you, you do well by having somebody who's done it before to help you make the decisions, help you make all the choices that you have to make, and guide you down that path. So, Kelly, one of the uh, things that I've heard a lot about with either existing clients or people who have gone down the road a little bit is that leadership buy-in, leadership knowledge, leadership uh, uh, expertise is is a crucial element to a successful lean agile and or safe implementation and uh, and I think we're going to touch upon that a little bit more in our next podcast yeah so a, a quick summary related to some of the barriers you need leaders to help get over the barriers it changes hard and so you need leaders to help an organization get through that difficulty uh, we need leaders who have connections with their regulatory partners to manage the change to show that this is not something to be concerned about with the regulators. Um, we need leaders to help guide the organization in, a, in learning and adapting a new, a new method. So yeah, absolutely, leadership is key, and, and we'll get into that in more detail in the next podcast. And that's uh, part of what's in your uh, TIR 45, right? That's part of, uh, or that's quite a lot of what's in, in that, that document, right? Yes. And so okay. I'd like to, to close with that. A way to get over many of these barriers, specifically in the medical device industry, is to use the guidance of TIR 45. Uh, you can get that through the AME website. And there are classes specifically on TIR 45. And TIR 45 can be stitched into any um, Agile training to help make organizations understand a little bit better how Agile applies in their context. Um, so highly recommend taking mm -hmm. a look at that document. That's good advice. And uh, we'll sign off here. Thanks for for joining us um, with 321 Gangs Change the Conversation podcast. Um, adding on to, to what you just said, Kelly, there are leading safe classes that are uh, often a key first step to helping leadership understand how agile and lean practices uh, can be applied and managed in an organization. So check out the links below for um, classes coming uh, to a city or town near you. And we'll pick up on how to get started with uh, lean, agile, and safe in the medical device industry in our next podcast. Thanks very much.